بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> اعظم الله اجورنا واجوركم بمسابنا بابي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاه والسلام you heard yesterday's lecture and we are going to continue on that theme today and building up in the next few days towards some understanding and structure to our lives and our understanding of what we are all about what god is all about the role he plays and how and what is expected from us and how we are supposed to arrive at it But there is a profound purpose here in this worldly life of ours. It is not to be taken lightly. Not a single moment of it is to be taken lightly. And at the same time, it's a huge bestowal upon us. And something quite grand is going on. You will see towards the end of today's lecture, if we manage to get there, that the dynamics of this life and this world are constructed in a way to bring out something that is hidden and concealed within us. It's structured in that way. And therefore, the whole notion that God has created us and placed us here and is going to reward us and punish us will be revised, radically revised by the end of the next four or five days, hopefully. That that is not the case at all. There is something quite profound going on. We will also see that God is involved in our lives and that is the essence of life that we are supposed to reach at and he's supremely beyond it as well and that is the aspect of God that we have to flow towards so God is both the intimate and God is both the objective yet in the workings of this universe there is a lot more going on so God is also involved And he is also above and beyond it all, as we will hopefully make it, uh, will attempt to, attempt to explain. Now, at least anybody thinks that this life is to be taken lightly or that it's a joke. I mean, the introduction would have us think that this life is just in vain, that God knows everything, he creates everything, and everything obeys his foreknowledge, and then he rewards and punishes accordingly. That doesn't make sense. It's a very useless life in which, as opposed to a merciful God, a demonic monster is just having reconfirmation of his own authority and of his own foreknowledge. That is not the God that is within us there. We have not created the heavens and the earth and whatever is within the two in vain or as a pastime, or as sport. In another verse it says, وَمَا We have not created the heavens and the earth and whatever is between the two, save by the absolute truth and the ajalun musamma and the appointed hour that will come. Look at these verses. These are phenomenal verses to reinforce within our minds that this is A very serious affair. Have you assumed that we have created you in vain and that you will not be returned to us? These verses in themselves are so telling that something has happened. Something is happening far beyond what we have conceived through our understanding of religion. It is as if we are reading these verses And we are altogether oblivious to these verses altogether. We are reading them on a daily basis. 
and somehow they fail to sit within our minds. Somehow we're just reading over them. They don't mean anything to us. Anybody reading this verse of Hasibtum Annama Khalaknakum Abasa, Wannukum Ilayna La Turjaun, that we have created you in vain and you will not be returned to us, will stop and think and try and understand that whatever they have thought of life, of God, doesn't tally with this verse. This verse is saying there's a huge purpose for you. And how can that equate with a God knowing everything before he creates everything? Despite that, he creates everything. Everything obeys his foreknowledge and everything runs the course in accordance with what God knows. What purpose can there be in such a worldview, a theological worldview? It defies any purpose. Yet, we don't think about these verses or even if we think about it, we want to cut and paste and chop and change and fit it all within our inaccurate paradigm. It reminds me of Newtonian paradigm of the cosmos, that there is gravity and everything is mechanically moving. When newer research was coming out, what we were doing was we were chopping, tweaking, tinkering in order to fit it into the Newtonian paradigm. Eventually, it became quite obvious that the Newtonian paradigm does not work. And then Einstein came. And now another paradigm is needed because the paradigm of Einstein answers majority of our cosmological questions. But the new questions that are taking birth, we are finding that we have to tweak Einstein's theory of relativity, general and special relativity. Am I showing off again? No, right? It's, it's quite okay. This is going through. But there will come a time when we will confine Einstein's paradigm to a particular expression of a particular aspect of universe and there'll be a broader paradigm. See, this is what we do. This is what happens in our minds. You ask me 20 years ago, I would have made perfect sense of all of these verses in my given paradigm. It is only when we are ready to check our assumptions again that we arrive at a world that is fluid. That thing that happened to me in the mashhad of Imam Rada, salamu alayhi, that the universe just collapsed. It just did not hold together. The paradigm just went, it crumbled. This is what I'm trying to say here, that we need to now think and understand that what we have understood and what we are understanding and the way we are thinking and the way we are receiving the Quran is not accurate at all. Yeah? And we have to rethink into it. And I don't mean this with a, with a tone of arrogance at all, with utmost humility. Now, before we go into the recap from yesterday, which I do need to do, and then build on it for today, because it's going to be another one of those sort of a lecture. Look at Allah in the Quran. Allah is muhsin. He's not even just. He is muhsin, the one who does ihsan, who does favor. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He goes beyond that. Man jaa bil hasana, falahu khairun minha. The one who does one good deed, he will have a lot more good from it. It's the growth property. Woman And the one who does an evil deed, then the people who do evil deeds, they will only get its recompense equal to the evil deeds that they've done. Inna Allah laysa bi dhallamin lil abid. Allah is not oppressive to his creatures. So if you do good, God will go out of his way to do utmost more good for you. But if you do evil, his justice does not allow him to punish you beyond your evil deed. The role of God is phenomenal in all of this life of ours. God has to be understood and re-understood again and again. You see, and we will explain this. God is that intimate companion of ours who has accepted us despite and in spite of knowing all our dark side and evils. God is the only one from whom we don't need to hide. Yes, there comes a point in which we feel shy from God and embarrassed. I do not deny that. But at times, the heart just yields to God and says, Allah, the greatest security that I have is that you know what goes on inside me. It is not hidden from you. I am a transparent medium in front of you that you can look at fully. And that gives me the full security 
And in tomorrow when I meet you, I'll tell you, Allah, you know what is in there. It's all evil and it's all whatever it is and you know it. As Isa is asked, Isa, did you say this and that to the people? Isa said, Lord, if I have said it, you know it. You know what is in my soul. I do not know what is in your soul. Why are you asking me? That is what God is. The one with whom we can be one. You are my Allah. As evil as I am, as despicable as I am, as long as you know what I am, and I'm with you and I can share with you, I'm fine. Imagine to have somebody like that with whom you do not need to pretend. That is Allah. Allah. That is Allah. The one with whom we bond so intimately. That is the Allah that the Prophet and Imam Ali and Al Hassan and Al Hussein worshipped. That was the God that they worshipped. Not this God of paradise and hell. I mean, that's also God. Don't stop worshipping, please. Don't stop praying. I'm going to talk about this later on. Not today, in a few days' time. But that is the intimate bonding that we have with God. Now we are recapping from yesterday. We stated the verses are on the WhatsApp link that has been sent to everybody, I believe. But I'll still say it so we can bring it out on our smart devices. Yesterday we said... The Qur'an is the word of God. But who is phrasing the words of God? Who is phrasing the message? The message may not be worded as far as the message is concerned. Allah Matabatabai has a phenomenal discussion on, on it. That Allah has sent the verses. Thumma fusilat. And then these verses have been torn apart and set into words. So when Allah reveals, they do not have words, they are just meanings. And then they are rendered into Arabic language, as we said yesterday, we gave those verses, that they are then phrased in Arabic, in accordance with the context of the Prophet Muhammad and whatever is happening around him. And then the message is coming. So who is wording it? So yesterday we said, the we in the Quran is not necessarily all the time the royal we, remember? And we got, went through those verses. And we said, sometimes... It can be angels, but this we are claiming to create the angels as well. So if they are angels and they are lofty angels, Imam Sadiq says, these are awliya of Allah, the very lofty awliya of Allah that act on behalf of God. So we said the angels act on behalf of God, so the awliya are acting on behalf of God. But these awliya are more superior to the Prophet because the verse that we read yesterday, that if any one of these noble creatures of God, the Prophets, if they were to claim God had for themselves, we will throw them into hell. So these, whoever what the we is in this instance, is well beyond the Anbiya and the Imams. They are well beyond it. Yeah? It is the realm of what I will call loosely realm of divinity. Now, let's go to uh, verse uh, Surah 42, verse 51. I'll take it slowly, even though it might take longer. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان لبشر أن يكلمهم الله إلا وحيا It is not right for a man that God should speak with him save through revelation or inspiration because the word revelation wahi in the Quran is also used in the meaning of inspiration and instinct ووحينا إلى أم موسى we reveal to the mother of Moses your Lord revealed to the bee. That's instinctual. Yes? He gesticulated to them. So the word wahi here, save by wahi means, by subtle means, the message is conveyed, but directly. Yeah? Or oh, from behind a veil. So they might hear a voice from behind the veil. We are told that is possibly Kallam Allah Musa Taklima. God spoke with Moses and he singles out Moses in the verses. He gives everybody their miracles, but he singles out, the Quran singles out Moses. Kallam Allahu Musa Taklima. And God spoke with Moses. So it might be min Murai Hijab. Aw Yursil Rasula. Or God will send a messenger. For Yuhi Bidnihi Mayasha. And the messenger will then reveal through the consent of God whatever he wants. 
Now it could be whatever God wants or whatever the messenger wants who has been ordained by God. Now we are seeing that there are several ways in which God is communicating, either directly or from behind a veil or through a messenger. But in the first one, the direct communication maybe is the finest one in which there is no mediation of words. The second one is very intimate one, but there's a mediation of words. The third one is mediation of words, possibly with expressions that are constructed. So you have a meaning, which is then rendered into words by the messenger. And the messenger here is an angel. Yes? For you, this messenger that God sends is an angel. And we'll see that in just a little while. It's not the prophet, it's the main messenger. Messenger is the angel revealing it to the prophet. Now here, the angel who is revealing it to the prophet, for convenience sake I'm saying angel, is phrasing the message of God in accordance with the circumstances and the context of the prophet immediately. Yes? So, Bibi Aisha is being accused of a, a, an unchaste act. Surah Nur comes. Exonerates her. Anyway, the person who came with pride accusing her, La tasabu sharun lakum, bahuwa khairun lakum. O Muhammad, do not see that, do not think that that is evil for you, it is good for you. But that particular wahi was phrased exactly in accordance with the circumstance of the Prophet. Whatever was revealed was a meaning, but it was molded in a way that was appropriate for the Prophet to receive. Now, Surah Nahal, which is Surah 16, verse 101 and 102. Look at it, please. Look at the phenomenal things that are in the Quran that are escaping our minds. وَإِذَا بَدَّلْنَا آيَةً مَكَانَ آيَةٍ And when we change a ayah, a verse, in place of another verse, the we are saying that when we change a verse in place of another verse, and where is the changed verse goes? We don't know. Where is it gone? But when we change a verse in place of another verse, Wallah, who a'alamu bima yunazzil, and Allah knows best with what he is revealing. Can you see this? You can immediately see that something is happening here. And when we change a verse in place of another verse, and Allah knows what he is revealing, we are fashioning it for you. We are fashioning it for you. Then Allah knows what he is revealing. And if he has changed his revelation, then we will change it as well. There is dynamism here that is phenomenal. That it is all known, yet it is happening in the moment. The next verse says, Kul nazalahu ruhul quds min rabbika bil haqq. Say, the Holy Spirit is revealing it on you with the truth. So we and the Holy Spirit from your Lord is a rank below the we. It appears here. Now somebody can say you can have a seamless story that we is God, Allah is God, and Ruhul Quds is revealing it from the Lord who is God as well. You can have that interpretation. But when you look at them all together, you will say, no, no, no. There is distinction. There is a nuance in here that cannot fail to be noticed. Now, that was just recap and we will just recap a little bit more. And then we'll go into today because it will set the scene for today. So now that verse, Imma nuriyannaka ba'da alladhi na'iduhum aw natawaffayannaka fa ilayna marji'uhum thumma allahu shahidun ala ma yaf'alun. Now this is Surah Yunus, Surah 10, verse 46. Look at it closely. Look at the verse and the tonality. Imma nuriyannaka, we will either show you some of what we promise to do to them, O Muhammad. Or we will seize you before that, i.e. we will take your life away before we do it. So there is ambivalence here. We will either do this or we will not, right? Now we are saying God does not have that ambivalence. So these are other agencies that are talking on behalf of God and ordained from God. Now look at the verse. For ilayna marji'uhum, they will all return to us. Now look what happens. And then Allah will be a witness on what they do. So Allah is kept as a separate portion of the verse. 
we will either show you or we will take you away. You know, you don't know what we are going to do. Once the whole story of humanity ends, they will come to us. And then Allah will be a witness at that point. You can see that the we is distinctly something else. Either the royal we or we as God with angels or we as just other than God. But ordained by God nonetheless in a system that is a unitary system. Inevitably. Now again we are going to the we because I just find it very important to point this out so that next time when you or I read the Quran, the virus is so prominent in the brain we never read it the same way again. Yeah, You do know when the virus enters it wipes the hard drive clean, right? These kids don't know what hard drive means anyway. Yeah, they, they just work with their iPhones. Look at this verse, Surah Maryam 19, Surah 19 verse 85. If anybody is any doubt that there is a distinction between we and God, look at this verse. Yawma nahshurul mujrimina ila rahmani wafda. The day in which we raise the guilty towards the Rahman in groups. Rahman is God. Qul ud'u Allah abidur Rahman. Say, call him Allah, call him Rahman. These are names of God. The day in which we raise the guilty to the Rahman in their groups. So we who are doing the raising are other than Rahman to whom the raising is being done. So we here is not God. Yes, it's not the royal we. At least in this verse, it seems to be very clear. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't think that was enough, then turn to Surah 70, verse 40. Not only I stopped at this verse when I was reading it again and again, but I know others who have studied under me independently when they came to this verse, they got startled. They said, what is this? How can we make sense of this? Have you got it? فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِرَبِّ الْمَشَارِقِ وَالْمَغَارِبِ إِنَّا لَقَادِرُونَ I swear by the Lord of the Easts and the Lord of the Wests, we are most certainly most capable. I, Lord, and we, all three combined in one verse. I swear by the Lord of the Easts and the Lord of the Wests, we are most certainly most capable. Look at the phenomenal nuance here. Quran from day one never wished to hide anything. What is doing the hiding is not the Quran, is our presumptions in there. Something that is so obvious becomes concealed. Because we don't want to look with the eye of clarity. Alhamdulillah, Rabbul Alameen. Allah is Rabbul Alameen. But then you have Rabbul Masharik al Maharib as well. So all the Rububiyah is Allah's. He is the absolute Rabb. He is the Rabb of all things. And every Rububiyah, minor Rububiyah, is God's Rububiyah as well. But you've got I, Rabb, and we conjoined in one verse. I hope that's done the damage. Now we're going to the word Rabb. If you look at the word Rabb in the Quran, it's used in three ways. One is Rabbul Alameen. As the Lord of all. One as the personal relationship that each one of has, us, us has with God independently. And one is Rab, another entity clearly. And we will understand that more by reading the Bible. And one is Rab as a real entity whose attribution is to God. So there are four ways. I'm going to discuss possibly three today. Go to Al Imran, Surah 3, verse 38 to 40. We're going to have two references from Al Imran. Yeah? This is something we need to look at. Yeah? Now, Nabi Zakaria saw that Bibi Maryam was receiving food miracul miraculously. So he said, Where is this from? She said, This is from my God. Now, Zakaria was moved with emotions. He turned to his God inward turning. He did not articulate this. It was possibly the inner speech with God or he even said it. Either or. Rabb, Zakaria, 
At that point, Zachariah called his Lord. This is the inner calling. Might be articulated, but he's going calling Allah Rabbul Alameen. Kala Rabbi. He said, my Lord, habli min ladunka dhurriya tayyiba. Grant me from yourself a goodly offspring. Inna ka sami'ud dua. You listen to the supplication. In response to this prayer that he makes to God, فَنَادَتْهُ malaika, The angels called out to him. The angels called out to him. وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يُسَلِّي فِي الْمِحْرَابِ He was praying, standing in the mahrab. أَنَّ اللَّهُ يُبَشِّرُكَ بِيَحْيَى Allah gives you good tidings of Yahya, مُصَدِّقًا بِكَلِمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ who will verify the word of God, who is Isa, who is supposed to come next. وَسَيِّدًا وَحُسُورًا He will be a Sayyid and he will be confined to the mosque. وَنَبِيًّا And he will be a prophet. وَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And he will be amongst the righteous ones. So this is what the angels are telling Zachariah in response to his, his plea, My Lord, that is made inside his heart and possibly articulated by words. What does Zachariah do after that? The angels are speaking with Zachariah. Yeah? The angels are speaking with Zachariah. I'm doing it this way, so I'm not Zachariah, but that's the natural way you gesticulate, right? You know, the mood is very heavy. Lighten it. You know, when we laugh a little bit, the point goes in. Yeah? Salawat. So now the angels speak with Zachariah. When angels tell Zachariah, the verse continues, Kala Rabbi. He said, My Lord. Now, who is Rabb here? Is he talking with Allah or is he talking with the angels? Kala Rabbi. Anna yakunu li ghulam. How can I have a child? Wakad balagani al kibaru. When I've become a ripe old man. Wamrati aqira. And my wife has become unbearing. Kala, he said. Now, who is saying here? Kala, he said. Kadalik Allah yaf'alu ma yasha. Allah does whatever he wants. This is a response Zakaria is getting from somebody that Zakaria is talking with. Can you see that? Otherwise, if it was God, he would say, Ana af'alu ma asha. I do what I want. So the angels called out to Zakaria, Inna la yubashiruka bi ghulamin ismahu Yahya. He said, Rabbi, anna yakunu li ghulam. How can I have a child? Qala, he said, you, Allah does whatever he wants. You can see clearly that there is a distinction. Now, if you read the Bible, the biblical texts, Genesis, at least the book of Genesis, you will see, and of course the later books, the word Lord was used not only for Allah. It was used for respectable uh, human beings. So here Zachariah is all likelihood seeing somebody and talking with him who is amongst the angels and angelic beings. So he's using the word Rabbi to address them. My Lord. We also say Imam Hussain is the Lord of the youths of paradise, don't we? He's the Lord. He doesn't mean he's Allah, but he's the Lord out of respect, right? What I'm trying to emphasize here is that the word Rabb in Quran is not always used to depict Allah. So be mindful of that. First word is we. The second word is my Lord. Again, Al Imran, Surah 3, verses 45 to 47. إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةَ يَا مَرْيَمُ Maryam has not made a prayer here. Yes, Maryam has not made a prayer. The angels visit her and tell her that Allah has purified you and has chosen you as the queen of women and so on and so forth. إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةَ When the angel said, Ya Maryam, إِنَّ اللَّهُ يُبَشِّرُكِ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنْهُ إِسْمُهُ مَسِيحٍ قِيْسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ Allah gives you glad tidings of his word. His name is Masih, Isa, the son of Maryam. Now at the end of all of that verse, Maryam says, Qalat. She said, Rabbi, anna yakunu li walad, walam yamsasni bashar. My Lord, how can I have a child when no man has touched me? The response comes, Qala, he said, 
kadalika kadaliki la yakhluqu ma yasha that is allah who creates whatever he wants that is how allah creates whatever he wants so again you can see that lady mary is responding to the angels who are talking with her with the word rabbi my lord so be mindful that the word lord in addition to be used in addition for it in addition to its utility to depict allah and its utility to depict the inner calling to allah it's also used for other than allah so now whenever we read quran and we you read the word rabb it doesn't necessarily have to mean allah it has to be work fixed worked out from the context of the verse and i feel a lot of these mistakes that we make in mis assumptions and misreading of the quran and we find god unbearably harsh is because we are not paying attention to the nuance that is within the quran now comes the most difficult part of this lecture that the word rabb as the creator is not allah is allah either it is an attribution to allah and it is a befitting expression of god at a particular level as we said la ilaha illa allah there is no ilah except allah can mean that there is no ilah flatly or it can mean every uluhiyah that you have any god function that is being handled by angels and all other beings it is through allah inevitably and allah is the first and the last and he is allah the unknown so everything that happens it's inevitably the work of god and ordained by god now i think i read this in mufid's work on theology when your lord said wa idha nafakhtu fihi min ruhi faqa'u lahu sajidin and when i breathe into him of my spirit fall prostrated upon your faces imam sadiq said allah does not have ruh allah is too lofty to have spirit it is a noble being due to whose nobility god attributes it to himself just as the kaaba god attributes to himself allah does not have a ruh that allah can breathe into so allah is attributing something very noble to himself due to its nobility has that gone through so now we find that there are there is a notion of metaphor these are all metaphors we say don't we so when we say yadullah fawqa aydihim the hand of god is on their hand we will say well this is a clear metaphor it means god's approval is with them or god's assistance is with them it's a clear metaphor but when we say kaaba is the house of god we will say there is something like the kaaba it is an entity it is a being out there it's cubically shaped right now with a golden door and whatever there is a kaaba but god doesn't live in there so the kaaba is not a metaphor the attribution of kaaba to god is a metaphor whereas in the first verse the hand of god is on their hand the hand is a metaphor there is no such thing as a hand it's the assist hand means here assistance of god but house of god means that there is something that you can identify with and you can see point at and say well that's a building there god doesn't live in there so the attribution of the kaaba to god is metaphorical attribution are you getting this distinction at one point that thing doesn't exist it's a pure metaphor meaning other than what it says it's meaning its function so the hand the function of the hand is support So when you say God's hand is on their hand means the function of the hand is there not a hand but when you say Kaaba is the house of God yeah Kaaba God doesn't live in there but nonetheless there is a house so it unlike the hand there is a house can you see that so the attribution to God is metaphorical if you've got that then we are in for a journey open surah sa'd surah 8 No, it's not Surah Eight. Surah Saad, verses seventy-one to seventy-eight. Which which uh, number is Surah Saad? Saad, sorry, thirty-eight. 
I got half of it right. Come along with me on this one, closely, yeah? Have you got it? Verses 71 to 78. Read these ones very, very closely with me. Okay? إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةَ When your Lord said to the angels, إِنِّي خَالِكٌ بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينٍ I am creating a bashar, one with skin, bashar, loosely human. I am creating a bashar from clay. فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَقْتُهُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And when I have structured him and breathed into him of my spirit, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Fall prostrated before him. The ruh was blown into the bashar, Adam. فَسَجَدَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ كُلُّهُ مَجْمَعُونَ The malaika fell in prostration, all of them, each one of them. The Quran is emphatic here. إِلَّا Iblis, Say for Iblis. إِسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ He behaved with pride and was amongst the deniers or the refuters or the adversaries. We want to explain that later on in this series. قَالَ يَا إِبْلِيسِ He said, O Iblis, مَا مَنَعَكَ What prevented you أَن تَسْجُدَ From prostrating لِمَا For the one خَلَقْتُ I created بِيَدَيَّ With my two hands. Can you see this? This is not one hand. This is two hands. Now, أَسْتَكْبَرْتَمْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الْعَالِينَ Have you acted in pride or are you amongst the lofty ones? These are all huge references here. Qala, ana khairun minhu. I'm better than him. Khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahu min teen. You have created me from fire. You've created him from clay. Qala, fakhrud minha fa innaka rajim. Get out of here. For indeed, you are the banished one. Winna alayka la'nati la yawmiddin. And upon you is my curse until the day of deen. You will be removed from my presence. Now, a Lord is speaking with shaitan, with Iblis, calmly having a conversation. Why didn't you, why didn't you prostrate to the one I created with my two hands? So I'm not going to because I'm better than him. You created me. So he's admitting you, have the, you are the one who created me. From fire, you created him from? Get out from here. Is there a place? Get out from here. Away with you. Get out. In another verse, Ahbat minha. فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا Both of these are used. Get out. Drop. Drop from it. Get out from it. You can clearly see the verses in this genre that are talking about the creation of Adam. They are using the notion of two hands. And a conversation ensues between Lord and between Iblis. That conversation is a heated conversation at times. Iblis, get out upon you, my curse. Do you see this one that you favored upon, um, favored me uh, upon me? I will misguide all of them, and you won't, you you shan't find any of them. Thankful to you, I'll fill the hell with you all. See, here the Rub is an entity whose attribution is to God. This is the most difficult part of it. Whose attribution is to God? It is ordained by God. The work is God's work. But just like as the Quran is being rendered, the work, the handiwork of constructing Adam is not to be attributed to God as the unknown. God as the absolute overwhelming beauty, the first, the last, the apparent, the hidden, the light of the heavens and the earth. But God in the capacity of Rab, where Rab is an attribution to God. Can you see this? So when we read the Quran, be mindful of these nuances. Now, if that has gone through, it will keep you awake tonight. Look at the next verse. Fajr 89, 22. 89, 22. Verse 89, uh, sorry, Surah 89, verse 22. 
وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا on the day of kiyama your lord will come and the angels lines upon lines can you see this this is again attribution surah haqqa verse 69 no, sorry surah 69 verse 17 wal malaku ala arja'iha and the heavens will appear frail and you will see angels at its corners wa yahmilu arsha rabbik rabbika fawqahum yawma idhin thamaniya and the throne of your lord will be carried on that day beyond the heavens by eight eight angels or eight beings will be carrying the throne of your lord yeah Allah doesn't need a throne. God as the ineffable one, Huwa. But this is a depiction of God, representation of God befitting that realm. Surah Bariyat, verse 47. I, I, I don't know which number is Surah Bariyat. Sorry, I forgot to look it up. Have you got that? Look at this verse. وَالسَّمَا بَنَيْنَاهَا بِعَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ And the heavens we made with hands. And we are expanding them. We know today from astrophysics that the heavens are expanding, don't we? If that's what the verse is referring to. But with hands. Here with hands doesn't mean the same as with one hand. Here it's a metaphor again with hands. But it's a radically different metaphor to the metaphor of hand. So you can see when you read the Quran very, very closely, there is so much nuance in there. And when we can start reading the Quran with that due care, with the nuance, the meaning radically changes. You do not find an unjust God, an unpleasant God. You really find a very real, serious story going on. A story that we must not downplay. Now, There is a verse in which the word Allah is not used in the meaning of Allah either. Yeah? Surah Baqarah, if you read from the beginning, who is the target audience by and large? Tell me quickly. It's not the Madinian Muslims. Who is it? The target audience. The Jews, the Jewish. Three clans there, prominent clans. So you will see وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً After that, those sequence of verses, Adam, out from here, the story of Israelites starts. Verses upon verses, a hundred odd verses are talking about the Israelites. And Nabi, their cow, and their this, and their that, and the mountain, and everything. Sulaiman, because it's all relevant to the Israelites. After those verses finished, Other verses are talking about ahkam of Islam. And they're also talking to the Jews. Now here comes a verse. Surah 2, verse 210. Yeah. Look at this verse. هَلْ يَنْذُرُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَعْتِيَهُمُ اللَّهِ فِي ذُلَلٍ مِنَ الْغَمَامِ وَالْمَلَائِكَ وَقُضِيَ الْعَمْرِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ Do they wait, save for Allah, to come to them in clouds of smoke with the angels and pass the decisive decree? Now, <coughs> I read the Shia Mufassirin back in the day and they said, look, this is a metaphor. Allah doesn't come within clouds of smoke, right? It's true. Allah doesn't come in the clouds of smoke. But the Quran is hinting at something else. You see, Quran is phenomenal. It's very particular about its target audience. It uses the word sometimes in accordance with the mind that it is addressing. If you look at the word, the, the book of Exodus, it's a biblical sort of book. Third or fourth book, I can't remember. Moses and others, they pray. This is, O oh Lord, we see you at night in a pillar of light. And in the daytime, we see you within a cloud of smoke. 
So as the Israelites were going on their journey on the Exodus, there was the Lord accompanying them. And the way they saw the Lord was in a pillar of light at night, in a cloud of smoke in the daytime. This verse, the Jewish people understood immediately what the verse was trying to say. Because they associated that being and Lord, that, that, that being as a Lord, and they called it Ilah. They called it Ilah in their language. And therefore the Quran is retaining the same word for them, so it makes perfect sense to them. I'm obviously I'm speculating here that this is what it means and it's not a metaphor. It's there. So the Jews to understand. So the Jewish people actually understood it. And that's why the Quran is adamantly saying to the Jews, you know this is from God, this Quran, because no one has access to this knowledge apart from you and apart from God. Who could have brought this sort of a verse out there? But my point in saying this is that when we read the Quran, the we may not be the royal we. Rab may not mean Allah as Allah. And at one occasion, the word Allah definitely, as Mufassirin say, is a metaphor. And I think from the reading of the Bible, it is actually using the word Allah in the context of how the word, how the Jews, Jewish people were using the word Ilah in that instance of the cloud of smoke. We're not going to finish a whole chunk today. I'm going to leave it. But we go to the verses to express the real purpose that is going on here, and we will be carrying that on for the next few days. Why are we here? And I'll conclude. Am hasibtum an tadkhulul janna walamma ya'lam illa alladhina jahadu minkum Do you assume that you will get into paradise and Allah has yet to know the people who will struggle amongst you? So there is something that is unknown in there. And the whole of this world is playing a particular drama and a game for us to reveal what is deeply within there. You will find verses, those bound to hell and destined to hell will go to hell. But they have to reveal their hellishness. Okay? It's amazing the way the Quran says it. Those bound to hell will go in hell, but they have to reveal their inner being. Then another verse, I'm just going to suffice with two here. مَا كَانَ اللَّهِ لَيَذَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ God will not leave the faithful people in the dire situation in which you are until he distinguishes the loathsome from the pure. And in Surah Ali Imran, you will find verses upon verses of this category that he will bring out what is inside you. He will reveal to you what is inside you. We will not direct you save to the path of hell. There is something that has happened well before our arrival into this world. There is something hidden inside there that at every breath and at every step is being caused to be revealed. The tests of this world are constructed in such a fine-tuned manner that it is all geared to prompt the inner being to reveal itself. But in that process of revelation, God is giving an opportunity that you can rectify it. As I finish, when the Muslims got defeated at Ohad, many of them ran to Abu Sufyan. And they said, spare us our lives and readmit us into the worship of Latin Uzza. Then they felt a sense of regret and embarrassment. And some of them ran away. Muhammad has died. What remains? The Quran says, Afain mata wa qutil. Even if Muhammad وسلم, was killed or he died, shall you turn away on your heels? Do you think that's it? You have to go towards God. You have to defend the truth. When they realized the unwholesomeness within, they became mindful and they regretted and they refined their souls. 
And that is when they entered within the folds of faith. They were headed somewhere despicable. The test was created to reveal to them what they really are. As a result, there was mercy and they changed their fate altogether. It's a phenomenal world. Something phenomenal is going on. We need to understand it or get to catch a glimpse of it at least. Keep God as the most beautiful one, the most intimate one. Read the Quran. He is with us. And we have to move through this life with full confidence in God and not belittle God or his commands. Pray. Obey the code of modesty. Fast. There is a reason why the Quran is commanding this and God is commanding this. And we will discuss this in a couple of days' time. Be the most faithful and most obedient creatures of God, but not in a bodily fashion, with reverence for God. And in order to attain that deep purpose that is hidden there. Umar ibn Sa'd spends a whole night ruminating, thinking. His son reports, my father was restless last night. Shall I kill Hussein and incur the damnation of God? Or shall I spare Hussein and forego the land of Ray? He pauses. But they say God is most merciful. I shall indeed put Hussein to death and receive the apple of my eye, the land of Ray, and suffer two years of torment in hell. And he justifies it to himself. So Umar ibn Sa'd test is placed before him. And he moves in that direction in which he reveals his demonic substance and becomes a hellish being. Hur, on the other hand, he intercepts Hussein, salamullah alayhi, <laughs> takes him to Karbala. He is the immediate agency for Imam Hussein's tribulations. He is the immediate agency for Imam Hussein's tribulation. He is awake at night before the dawn of Ashura, thinking, we shall not fight them. No, no. They will not put Hussein to that. He goes to Umar ibn Sa'ad. Shall you indeed fight Hussein? In no time shall their heads flow, shall their heads be decapitated from their shoulders, from their necks. No, in no time shall their heads roll. And their arms be decapitated. He understood. The intent of Umar. He was retreating. And he heard the call of Hussein. At the dawn. Hal min nasir. Yansurna. Hal min muhis. Yuhisuna. Is there anyone who will defend the household of the Prophet? Who trembled. He made way towards the camp of Hussein. Muhajir said to him, Hur, do you wish to preempt an attack? Muhajir said, I saw him tremble. I said, Hur, if they were to ask me who is the bravest of all in Kufa, I would utter your name. How your color has gone pale, how you tremble in awe. I see myself between heaven and hell. I will never prefer hell over heaven. Hur made his way towards Hussein, joined by his two sons and his brother. Hussein, do you have forgiveness in your heart for me? I come to you as that criminal who intercepted your path, who audaciously spoke against you, who grabbed the reins of your steed, oh Hussein. Do you forgive me? Dear brother, descend from your steed. Allah has forgiven you and I have forgiven you. Hussein, allow me to offer an apology to the daughters of the Prophet and the daughters of Fatima. I come to you penitent, O daughters of Muhammad. I come to you guilty. I am the one who is a cause for you to be trapped in this wilderness, for your brother to be killed on this day. Have forgiveness in your heart for me and do not complain to your grandfather, the prophet, about me. The cries filled the air. 
he stepped down from his steed and started beating his face. If only my hands and feet had become paralyzed. If only my tongue had been severed before I said what I said to Hussein. Some women came out and consoled her. Who came to Hussein? Hussein, allow me to fight alongside you. Hussein said, then beat. Urgos gives his two sons and his brother. Like a gallant warrior, he faces them. May God not quench your thirst for doing this to the grandson of the prophet. I am Hor, the most hospitable in Kufa. Renowned for the way I treat my guests. Is this how you treat your guests? They unleashed their swords upon him. He fought them gallantly. His horse was killed. He stood on his foot. He fought them until a fateful blow was delivered upon his head. As he fell to the ground and trembled, Hussein looked on. Alayka salam minni. Peace be with you from me, O Hussein. With Habib, Hussein arrives at the body of Hur takes his head and places it into his lap. Ni'am al-hur, al-hur yazid al riyahi The best of hur is the hur of the son of Yazid al-Riyahi. He said, Hur, your mother has named you accurately. Hur broke into a smile. Habib said, Hur, is his grandfather quenching your thirst with the goblets of Kothar? He said, no, Habib, I do not see his grandfather. Then what brings a smile upon your lips, O oh Hur? Because I find my head in his lap as I depart from this earth. Okay, so why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings and a people able to fulfill the mission for which they have been created? Why has Allah created human beings and... Are people able to fulfill the mission for which they have been created? If we can just wait until tomorrow and day after tomorrow's talk, we will explain that this is not the beginning of our existence. We have existed before this. This is just a consequence of what has happened prior to this. That might gesture at a response by the third day. Okay, so the next two days, We'll be building on the fact that this is not the commencement of the journey. The journey commenced somewhere else. This is just a very significant portion of the journey, like extremely significant portion, the most significant portion of our journey. Okay. Have we got any immediate questions, burning questions from the floor? Yes. Sango, Sheikh. Sango. Uh, so, Sheikh, this is a very interesting insight about like, how it's not always God that's being referred to in the verses. Okay. And so I think one of the things that a lot of people struggle to reconcile is the merciful God and the descriptions of the punishments in the Quran, like the burning Hameem and all these things. So are we saying that those descriptions are not authored by God? These are renditions made by agents who are acting on behalf of God? And it, yeah, so just your thoughts on that. So God is nothing but mercy, yes? And God is beyond heaven and hell altogether. And that's where we belong. We belong beyond heaven and hell. I'm not sure if we will be able to reach that part of these talks where we will talk about the non-eternality of heaven and hell, that heaven and hell are only intermediaries. I'm not sure if we will make it, yeah? But we might want to try and squeeze it all in. The world that is to come and this world are the same. This world is a minor reflection of that world. This world has got heaven and hell. We get incentivized, we get threatened, we get rewarded, we get punished. We get a courtroom setting, we get a judge. In that world, you have heaven and hell, reward and punishment. You have a courtroom setting with witnesses. This world is a faint reflection of that world, yes? But that one is extremely more emphatic and extremely real. The difference is that in this world, when we serve a prison sentence, 
It's the body that is serving it. And through the body, the mind is supposed to be reformed. Yeah? When we enjoy the blessings of this world, the body is enjoying it. And then the psychological state of ours rejoices. In that world, the soul is creating the punishment in hell. And the soul is creating the bliss in paradise. So that is a difference. When the body stays back in this world, the soul with its own properties creates an intense inferno and it burns itself and it recreates its skins and it burns itself and it recreates its skin. Yeah? And there in that world, it will wish and it will say, be and it is. Now obviously, the allusions in the Quran are there, but more emphatically are the hadith from the Prophet that say, look, you will say, be and it is. Lahumma yasha'un. They will have whatever they want. They will will it and it will be there. Yeah? So this world, that world is the same. Now, where does God fit into it? You see, think about God in this way. That when a person goes inside the prison, the intention is to reform that person. So there is mercy inside a prison sentence. Now, unless a person is wrongfully charged, we know, of course, in the court of hereafter, in the court of God, nobody can be wrongfully charged because the soul will be a witness. The soul will be a book, as we will discuss. The soul will be the word. The soul will pass its own judgment upon itself. The courtroom setting and the judge will only be a formality. The soul will do everything itself. Read your book. On this day, you are sufficient as a witness upon you. Yeah? Because the slate of the soul will bear everything and it will either become very corrupted or very enlightened. So here in this world, the prison is a mercy. In that world, the soul will eventually lose the tendency of creating rage and inferno. That is where God comes in, that he's a mercy, purging. Because the verse says, they will be in hell, khalidina fiha, carrying in there, madamat is samawatu wal ard, so long as the heavens and the earth are in place, illa masha Allah, save, Allah wills otherwise. Yeah? So Allah again is the one that overpowers the decisions in that other world. So God is extremely merciful. But we have to come to a point where we realize that hell is an expression of God's mercy because God is Rahman and Rahim. That is what fills the entirety of the cosmos. So I am my own punishment. <laughs> it's not God punishing me. In fact, God is putting out the fire and I'm rekindling it. Yeah. We'll explain these things towards the end if we reach there, yeah? Have we got any other questions from the floor immediately? Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, in, in today's lecture, you were talking about uh, the, the metaphors of uh, hands, the uh, hand of, uh, of Allah and the hand of the Lord. Uh, what, what uh, in, in terms of... Uh, Metaphors, uh, are, is, are we saying the hands are not a metaphor? So are we, uh, are we saying that what we are now talking about as Lord has an anthropomorphic uh, existence? Or so, so the thing I said was <clears throat> that if you look at the hand in the Quran, God's hand is on their hand. That's a pure metaphor because hand depicts the function of the hand, which is support. Yeah, God is supporting ordaining it. The heavens, we have created them with hands and we are constantly expanding. It's, no, it's a metaphor again, but it's not the same type of a metaphor. Here it means variety of things that were in play and are in play that are expanding the universe. It's a metaphor, but not the same type of metaphor. I created with my two hands now here, the hands are not metaphor in the sense of its function. Here, the hands are like the Kaaba. The Kaaba is a real thing. Hands are a real thing. But its attribution to God is metaphorical. So like saying, Prophet, you did not throw the stones when you threw them. Rather, God threw. You did not kill them when you killed them. Rather, God killed them. 
that does not mean that they did not get killed physically. They did get killed physically. But the attribution to God is somewhat of a metaphor. So there is a real throwing of a stone. Its attribution to God is metaphorical. Similarly, there is a real fashioning of Adam. Yeah? But its attribution to God is metaphorical. Not to say that those hands mean the simple metaphor like hands, God's hand is on top of their hands, God's ability. Because then God will say, why did you not proceed to the one I created? Or created with my one hand, or created with my hand. And then you wouldn't get subsequent exchange with Iblis. Why have you not prostrated? How dare you? Get out of here. Upon you, my curse, till the day of Qiyamah. That subsequent conversation is quite telling. That there is a real conversation taking place there. It's been attributed to God. Just like Prophet, you did not throw, rather God threw. Something physical happened. Yeah? So conversation did take place. But God, the lofty one, cannot be approached by a devil. He is very insignificant. God is God. You know, you can't, the devil can't have the right to talk with him like that when the Prophet Muhammad doesn't talk with God like that. Yeah? Can you see that? Even Moses doesn't talk with God like that. <clears throat> I did ask this question on the WhatsApp link as well, but I don't think I articulated myself very well. So I just wanted to ask about when you're referring to God and how he refers to different aspects as Rob and stuff, that it's not him, but it's something that he's attributed to himself. Would you say that God is like a multifaceted being with different levels and different, like, sub like almost a subpersonal explanation of cognitive function where there's different levels that are attributed to different functions? Or would you say he's more of a whole entity? Were you, were you here in yesterday's talk and the day before? We've discussed that in the elaboration of La ilaha illa Allah. That it can mean there is no God except Allah and that's it. It can mean he is the best of whatever is there. It can mean he is the only one in the ambit of everything that is happening. It's only him at the end of the day. And that all three of them are compatible. And all three of them simultaneously exist together. That there is no one better than God, Ahsanul Khaliqeen. Yes? There is no real God other than God. La ilaha illa Allah. Ma min illahin illa Allah. There is no ilah except Allah. And then, wal awwal, wal akhir, wal bahir, wal batin. He is the first, the last, the apparent, the hidden. Whatever other functions are happening, it is ultimately the function of God. Yeah? So all three are compatible, these um, interpretations. But we have to work out from each uh, verse uh, as to how we are going to interpret it. Yeah. So I'm going to take a question from online. Hopefully I do it justice. Um, so the question was, it's phrased as, my question is the word unatha in uh, Surah Nisa, 100, uh, verse 117. So we, well, yeah, sorry, what's the question, sorry? Um, does it mean female, according to the English translation, or does it mean weak and fragile? Sorry, what does it say? I, I didn't get it. So the verse, um, they call upon, instead of him, none but female deities, and they actually call upon none but a rebellious Satan. So the word, does it mean female, or does it mean weak? No. The pagans used to worship the daughters of God. Lat and Uzza, these main idols were goddesses. Now, you see, because we are so cut away from ancient history, the whole notion of gods and goddesses is a human ancient phenomena that has been running with in the human memory. So I do not believe that the Meccans just concocted it out of thin air. It was cultures crossing at that time. And they were bringing their teachings. And newer cultures were adopting the ancient teachings. So you have a whole notion of goddesses. And you can find 
signs of this in myths, in ancient writings, and possibly even in certain biblical books that did not make it into the Bible because they were too heretical. But you find this notion of goddesses. So yes, the verse is saying they're calling onto female de deities because they were female deities. Yeah? But the problem was that they associated whatever historically was there with God. And that was a problematic area. So I'm not saying that those sort of beings did not exist on the face of this earth. Yeah, they did. But they were creatures of God. But then they were given the status of God later on. Yeah? But no, no. It's a very, very deep thing that uh, I don't think I, I have the courage to explore or to even talk about. Yeah? I'm just going to take another question as well. So I think this is a little more straightforward. What are the reasons for different interpretation of the same verses of the Quran? So this is the most beautiful aspect of the Quran. You see, the Quranic words yeah, are such that you can derive many meanings from them. Now, when we got Osmani Codex, at that point we didn't have the haraka on the words. So a word was left ambiguous. People could interpret whatever they could interpret. But then the harakas were placed on the words and the meaning was tightened. Yeah? It was made firm that this is the meaning by and large that you will get. But it's the natural curiosity within our minds, based on the prophetic hadith, that the Quran has an apparent and a hidden and another hidden and another hidden and another hidden. Then it, it has matla that no one but God knows. Yeah? So each and every part of the Quran has inevitably a meaning that is not known by anyone. But before that, we can explore the layers of meanings, either from the actual word or the sequence or comparison of one word with another or one verse with another or in the context of the whole. It's a phenomenal thing, the Quran. It's like mind-blowing. Now that, the Quran leaves open for us to explore. I remember a hadith in which a, a person came to Imam Sadiq and he said, this Quran seems to renew itself. He said, yes, that's the nature of the Quran. It renews itself. But renews itself with what? With the advancement of the human intellect. So it mirrors the human intellect. As the human intellect advances and sharpens, the Quran yields those sharper meanings. And I think we have a, a hadith in the Sunni literature that the Quran or parts of the Quran will not be understood save after 1,400 years. The Prophet has reported to have said that. Yeah? Sheikh, uh, a question for you, if you can help me understand. Um, in the previous, I've missed the last two nights' talks, but I, I listened to the first couple. And it sounds uh, like... Uh, just put the, bring it closer to your mouth. Okay. Yeah. Listening to the talks, I've missed the last couple, so forgive me. Oh, you me. have? Sorry? You've missed the last couple? I did, yeah. I, okay. I, I will catch up. But in trying to understand God, uh, it sounds like I need to get a, a degree in philosophy or something before yeah. I can try to understand. If a simple person like me wants to try to understand God on, on, a, on a simple reading, with some basic Arabic understanding, I should be able to get it, right? Or get something, and in terms of guidance too. So it sounds like it's a very complicated subject that you're teaching. And it, how can somebody simple like me understand it just by reading the Quran without you telling me what you're telling me in these few sessions? What, have you, what you've been doing all your life, continue doing that. Okay. And you'll understand it and you know, you'll be satisfied and you'll be happy. That's the way to do it. What I'm surprised at is that these questions are there. That why is there so much rage and anger in God? When I travel the world, this is the, these are the questions I'm faced with. These are the questions that occurred to me. Now, on the one hand, 
You find somebody whose faith is so untarnished. You know, I know Allah is beautiful and all of this somehow makes sense. I just don't know how. Perfect. That's the way to be. Then there is a mind that says, I can't understand this. I, I don't have that level of faith. I need to understand before I can commit. Now, they are the people who will say, well, if this is all Allah, then I don't want this. That's why you are seeing a move towards atheism. But if you talk to, an, talk to an atheist about the God of the heart and love, they'll be pulled back. They'll say, yeah, well, we are ready to believe in a God like that. Mm. Of course, God should be like that, not the one our scripture. If you were to read the Bible, you will say, my God, what sort of a merciless God is this? So if you read the, I know I've been giving the reference of Exodus all the time, but I think this is in Genesis or maybe in Exodus, or the book of Numbers. So the Lord says to them, you sacrifice this way, offer this much as the sacrifice, the smoke sacrifice for me to sever, this much for me, this much for these people, and that portion that is for me, give it to the high priests and their sons, which were Aaron and his sons, and this one, which is the burnt sacrifice, burn it so its smell can come. And first and foremost, you'll think God can't say something like that, right? Now, Aaron, who is Nabi Harun, his son or sons, in veneration of the Lord, they slaughtered an animal immediately or they burnt something that they were not supposed to. Immediately a lightning shot and killed them and finished them off. And that is why where you find somewhere that, you know, the God is very angry. Can you see that? God is very angry. You must do exactly as he says. This that we have as Muslims is from the Jewish tradition. They are very, very precise and it's not their fault. If you look at the, at the way the tabernacle is being told to them to be built, how the smoke burnt sacrifice is to be given, how much portion is given here, it's very precise. And if they did anything wrong, they were chastised for it. Now, Anybody reading those verses in the name of God will not be ready to commit to God. Can you see that? Mm. Yeah? Thank now, you. the Quran is beautiful. It doesn't have any of those things. But the fiqh has it instead. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing that when the non-Muslims or the Muslims who are trying to understand the message of the Quran, their minds are already influenced by the Muslim mindset. And the Muslim outlook. So when they read the Quran with that mindset and that outlook, they say, oh, God is very harsh. Burn them forever and ever. The skins will burn. I'll put their skins back. So I'm just saying it is a real challenge. And I don't feel the generations to come will be appealed unless, unless sense is made. And there is phenomenal sense. We just have to explore it and expose it. And that's the reason why I chose these lectures. But yes, if the faith is intact, it's perfect. I do not find going on from our generation, there will be that faith. It will be more of curiosity and commitment after acknowledgement of the truth. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have another question from online. Um, keep your attention. Sure. Does the Quran uh, to describe uh, does the Quran describe a personal God with wishes and feelings, likes and dislikes? If so, how do we reconcile this with the absolute or the transcendent one? Tomorrow, day after tomorrow, we'll go embark towards another discussion that will lead on to this one on the third night. Okay, if God gives life. If he takes away before that, then somebody else can deal with it. But I want to discuss this on the third night from today. Yeah, inshallah. I'm I'm gonna I'm going to ask a question I asked you personally yesterday, but you yeah. mentioned it at the, the the beginning of the lecture as well. So I asked quite directly: Are you the first person to take this perspective on on the Quran and you know noticing these um, you know without being disrespectful semantic differences between the verses? And 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 then you you responded to me and said, actually, I'm not the first one. And, and and someone else was with you as well and made reference to that. And you made reference to that at the beginning of the lecture. 
He said Imam Jafar Sadiq. So you know, Imam Jafar Sadiq was the person who started this off, yeah? I'm not the first one. So if you can elaborate on that, that'd be really good. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So Imam Sa Jafar Sadiq was asked, you know, minhum wa When they angered us, we sought revenge from them and we drowned them all. They said, we can't make sense. Imam Jafar said, this is not God talking. These are the awliya of Allah talking. Now, I read it in a philosophical treatise of faith, Kashani, but Dr. Fanai sent me the reference from Kafi. In, in, in uh, Kafi of Kulaini, he has collected this hadith, yes? And Kulaini sees it as, as Mu'tabar. My yardstick of validity, invalidity of hadith is totally different to the muhaddithins, yes? I have a very, very different way of evaluating a hadith. If they accord to the theme rationally, in whatever way, I will accept it as valid, even if the chains are all weak. Yeah? If it doesn't make sense, like the cursing hadith, and the miracle hadith, I'll just reject it, no matter how many authoritative people might have said it. Yeah? It's like one of this very, you know, this hadith that uh, Imam Hassan, I mean, I know they're going to say this is a weak one, but I don't want to give the strong one because it's going to startle everybody. Imam Hassan was there in, in, in Hajj and uh, they said, what miracle do you have? You don't have miracle. So he ordered a house to levitate. So the house levitated and he stood underneath it and had a conversation. Then he said to the house, come back down and he came back down. I mean, you know, in modern day terms, you know, I had a cup of tea and uh, you know, people like me, let's say, if I, if I had that medical, I'd be smoking and drinking a cup of tea in the house, you know, above my head. And There's another miracle that somebody said to the 12th Imam, what's your miracle? So he saw a camel, laden with goods, flung it in the sky. NASA spotted it last year, <laughs> landing on Mars. A very distraught camel, confused. Don't know where it is. But the thing is that the animal rights campaigners are going to sue the Shias because their Imam has thrown a camel in the air for the last 1,400 years. Imagine the compensation we have to pay. So what I'm saying here is that our hadith for me have different ways in which we verify them, yeah? I find that this hadith from Imam Sadiq makes perfect sense like the other one that we quoted earlier on, that God does not have ruh. He's attributing the ruh to his self, yeah? Just like he's attributing the Kaaba to his self. The Kaaba in the four or five verses that contain Kaaba is always termed as the house of mankind. In one or two it says, وَتَّهِرْ بَيْتِيَا Purify my house. Yeah. So in one or two it says my house together with the house of mankind, but majority it's house of mankind. But God has attributed the house to himself. Similarly, God is attributing the ruh to himself. Yeah. So Imam Sadiq is the first person, to the best of my knowledge, because I've read it there, that has inspired these thoughts. Did that hadith make rational sense? only after your plane trip and visit to the shrine? Or did that make sense before? This thing happened at the time when I went to the shrine, actually. It's, it's, it's a huge thing. Because I was studying Faiz's work, Usul al-Ma'arif, at the age of, just before the age of 40. Yeah, you're right. It all happened together. This hadith, the shrine incident, all of this was happening together. It's amazing you asked that. It was happening at that time. Yeah. That's it? Got another question. If there's anybody else at the back, please. I haven't got eyes in the back of my head. But I will look. Uh, just kind of following on from my previous question about the uh, the, the the hands that fashioned uh, Adam alayhi salam. Uh, so you said the, the 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 act of fashioning and is what is attributed to Allah. Right? No, one is the, a metaphor, hand represents the yes. function. One is hand represent hand. Yeah. Yes? But the attribution is to God. Yeah. Just like Kaaba represents a building, but the attribution is to God. Yes. Yeah. So that implies there's another entity which has fashioned... Uh, well, if you, well, if you read the verse of the Quran, with us away to who? Yes? 
and when I have uh, balanced it off. Inni khalikun minatin bashar. I'm going to create from clay a man. Creation means to shape. Khalakaka fasawaka fa'adalak. So if you look at all the expressions of the Quran, you are seeing an act of fashioning. And of course, he said, says to Iblis, Lima khalaktu bi yadayya, the one I created with my two hands. Yeah? So, do we so there, there was a real act taking place. Yeah. Do we mo- know more about what this entity is that uh, even Iblis is talking to? And yeah, so, so in terms of our general understanding of uh, angels and so, jinn. So, so here, obviously, obviously, the only way out of this is to say it's a representation of the Lord of the worlds at a befitting level of creation of humanity. That's the best response we can give for now. Yeah? It's the best response we can give for now. It's like a professor talking to a class of graduates, but the professor is also a grandfather talking to a two-year-old child. So the professor talking to graduates will talk differently. The same being talking to a two-year-old grandson of his will talk differently. So the same professor will have different expressions at different levels. That's the best way to understand it for now. Yeah? Sheikh, this is the last question. This clock is slightly ahead, but hopefully we'll finish uh, by 11 o'clock. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Um, Sheikh, how do you reconcile criminals with Allah's mercy? So, from your opinion as a Sheikh, um, someone, someone like Hitler, for example, killed so many, let's say, millions. <coughs> so, where does God's mercy come into that? Or will God, uh, you know, the way most of us will understand it is, um, He's merciful. But at the same time, to those kind of people, to evil. He, he, so, I'll say tomorrow that there is no difference between a demon and a saint. They are all in coming from one soul. Yeah? We are all part of the same one soul. In there is a being that does not understand gender, that does not understand evil, that does not understand good in the way we have understood. That being is the untarnished beauty. This state is a state of blemish and adulteration. Hell and heaven hopefully will purge us of this state. Even being a saint is a veil. Being a demon is a veil. So we're going to explain that from tomorrow. But God as God, God as God, doesn't have enemies. God as the Supreme One is too much beyond having enemies. It's too grand. Shaitan is nothing to be an enemy of God. Shaitan doesn't even, you know, he's not even a speck of dust. How can he be an enemy of God? You have to be something mighty to be an enemy of God. There is nothing mighty to be an enemy of God. Yeah? So nothing can be the enemy of God. God is way too beyond. Yeah? You can be enemy to somebody like your own self. Yeah? So if there is a giant... And there is an amoeba. The amoeba says, I am the enemy of the giant. The giant says, oh, okay, fine. You know, just okay, you're my enemy, fine. He doesn't have time for the amoeba. Do you get it? It's too lofty, too great. On the other hand, who has created the devil in the first place? Who? Can you see that? And if he's the first and the last, and the apparent and the hidden, and the light of the heavens and the earth, then is the devil at in, in the first place existing. So there are different ways of understanding things. 
But for the devil to be here is a mercy of God upon all of us and upon the devil as well. Yeah? Well, hopefully we can un unpack that somewhat. And if not this year, because we're not going to unpack it fully this year, at some other time, if God wills, and if you're there, and if you remind and prompt this question, inshallah we can go towards it.